the River Wharf winds approximately 65 miles through some of Northern England's most scenic countryside. In many respects, the River Wharf embodies all that's beautiful and wholesome in Mother Nature. But the idyllic facade hides a dark and unsavory past. This is especially true of a narrow stretch called the Bolton Strid, which is widely regarded as the most dangerous stretch of river anywhere in the world. The Strid has a 100% fatality rate, guys. Um, and as I say, it's 217 feet deep. So yes, there are people swimming in my videos, but they're not in the Strid. If they're in the Strid, believe me, it will be national news. Maybe even international because of the backstory that the Strid's got. Bolton Strid's name comes from its location near Bolton Abbey, and the term stride because at the narrowest point it is possible to leap or walk from one bank to the other without getting your feet wet. But even jumping from one shore to the other is a risky undertaking. At Bolton Strid, the river wharf narrows from about 40 feet to just 4 feet wide before cascading over a scenic waterfall. From first observation, it appears pristine and shallow enough for swimming and other activities. But Bowen Strid is a wolf in sheep's clothing, because beneath the calm lies a deep, dark channel and a surprisingly strong current. The thing about the Strid is that it famously has an optical illusion, yeah. where it looks a lot narrower than it actually is. Yeah. And when they go in, the underneath of it is hollowed out with pebbles that have yeah. kind of turned into potholes. And the currents trap bodies, and they just kind of swirl around endlessly. In addition, both of the banks are severely undercut and covered in slick moss, mud, rocks, and vegetation that become even more treacherous when wet. Needless to say, those who fall in generally find it nearly impossible to pull themselves out. Bolton Strid's deceptive danger is also a result of its water being forced through a narrow bottleneck. This choke point causes pressure and velocity to increase, which in turn causes the water to become exceptionally tumultuous. In fact, it often moves in multiple directions at once, and eddies, whirlpools, flash floods, and other phenomena often appear and disappear quickly without warning. The chaotic activity has also led to significant erosion over the years. The softest spots are the first to go, and they often leave behind pressure pockets, channels, caves, and fissures hewn from the porous limestone. Together, these submerged voids and the chaotic flow are capable of trapping and holding objects underwater indefinitely. The forces are so great that no human or animal unlucky enough to fall in has a fighting chance of getting out alive. Experienced scuba divers were permitted to explore Bolton Strait in the 70s during periods of low flow, but they were never able to determine just how deep the water really was. More recently, in 2021, an English YouTuber lowered a GoPro down into the Strid and determined in some places that it may plummet down nearly 200 feet. Some suspect it's far deeper. Man-made stone pathways called stepping stones span over the river in multiple areas. But even there, there's no guarantee of safe passage and you can still easily fall in. Getting caught on the stones in the middle of the river during a flash flood would likely end in disaster. Unsurprisingly, there's a long-standing warning in the area. Simply don't try to jump Bolton Strid. If you fail, you pay the price with your life. Local authorities have erected a number of warning signs, but each year careless and foolhardy visitors disregard them, largely because the river just doesn't look particularly threatening. Of those who do enter the water, many don't survive. The bodies of some victims turn up downstream days, weeks, or months later. It's believed that those who don't resurface are held down by the chaotic currents and trapped in the underwater caves and crevices. Considering how long the river has been in existence, it's reasonable to assume that these caves are littered with the bones of the deceased. Bolton Strid's first victims were two young lovers intent on eloping one moonlit night. Unfortunately, they lived on opposite shores of the river wharf, but instead of crossing one of the bridges in the area, the young woman chose to rendezvous with her lover walking across at Bolton Strid. But as he looked on longingly from just a few feet away, something happened. And she was immediately pulled beneath the water. Sadly, her lover suffered the same fate after leaping in to try to save her. Visitors of Bolton Strid still claim that the young woman's terrifying cries can be heard over the gurgling water. 
and that the two sometimes are seen walking hand in hand beside the river that heartlessly snuffed out their lives. William de Romley attempted to leap across the river while out hunting, but like the younger maiden before him, William wound up in the river and drowned. Unbearably distraught over her son's death, his wealthy mother, Lady Alice de Romley, donated a sizable portion of land to local monks in exchange for their promises to pray for his soul every day. Centuries later, in 1815, English poet William Wordsworth commemorated William de Romley's death in the force of prayer. In the poem, Wordsworth speculates that the young man may have made the leap hundreds of times before, but the river was running particularly strong and deep on that fateful day. Arthur Reginald Smith was born in Skipton and Craven, Yorkshire, in 1871, but he grew up just a few hundred yards from the river wharf and spent much of his time there as a child. Arthur was a talented painter from an early age. He set out to paint the river wharf near Bolton Abbey on September 14th. But as an experienced artist, he knew that patience was key, and the process of making a remarkable painting in such an idyllic setting couldn't be rushed. After all, he needed to consider things like color, perspective, the relationship between shadow and light, and perhaps most importantly of all, composition. When he found out what he was looking for, he set up his easel, and just a few yards away from the strid, he began making rough sketches before putting his brush to paper. But Arthur never actually began painting. At some point, while sketching, he stopped what he was doing and walked to the water's edge. Then, he decided to jump across the strid, simply to thumb his nose at the nefarious river. His wife notified the authorities when he didn't show up at home that evening. The police responded quickly and discovered his easel and painting supplies near Bolton Strid, but the artist himself seemed to have vanished into thin air. Police searched the adjacent forest and dragged the river for nearly a week. But nothing was ever found, until Arthur's tweed hat mysteriously turned up downriver a few days later. Anxious to put the matter to rest once and for all, police hired a local diver named R. Bolton, who'd built a solid reputation for locating submerged bodies elsewhere. With the artist's cap to guide him, Bolton was convinced that he could use his own body and his delicate diving stick to establish an electrical connection with Arthur's corpse if it was still in the area. With everything needed, Bolton began walking downstream from Arthur's last known location while gingerly holding his trusty diving stick, which consisted of two hazel twigs attached by a thin wire. When he'd gone just 50 yards, the tip of the two twigs began moving toward the water, at which point he stopped, pointed to the river, and informed the police that he located the body of Arthur. Despite high water, the strid was dragged once again and Arthur's battered body was found pinned against a rock, exactly where the diver said it would be. Though the artist had clearly drowned, the discovery gave his family some measure of closure. Foul play and murder were ruled out. The coroner gave an open verdict because it wasn't clear how he ended up in the water in the first place. However, the case became a little more clear after he had been laid to rest when a number of regular visitors to the area stated that they had seen him jumping from one side of the river to the other on multiple occasions. This isn't particularly surprising, even for a 63-year-old who was a veteran and an avid outdoorsman who kept himself in tip-top physical shape. Like many men his age, he may have thought that he was more agile and physically fit than he actually was. And, like young William de Romley, the beautiful river may have lured him into a carelessness that ultimately cost him his life. In the end, he probably just slipped and fell into the river like so many before him. And that's probably where he would have stayed forever if the police hadn't called R. Bolton. The irony of surviving an epic war only to be killed by a picturesque river just a few yards wide. After his body was cremated, Arthur's ashes were scattered into the water. Photographs of Lynn and Barry call it, invariably show young, attractive, smiling newlyweds beaming with excitement about the future. The Collets got married in August of 1998 at the parish church in the village of Long Sutton Hooks, where Lynn grew up. By then, Barry had already made honeymoon arrangements, but his original reservations fell through at the last minute. Their honeymoon cottage was near the Apple Tree Rook and the Yorkshire Dales, just a stone's throw away from the River Wharf. Despite abysmal weather on the second day of their honeymoon, 
25-year-old nursing student Lynn and 29-year-old computer engineer Barry set out from their cottage for a short stroll along the river near Bolton Abbey. According to witnesses who saw them that morning, they were dressed for the weather and holding hands when they set out at approximately 10.35 a.m. With promising careers in a new home at Basingstoke and a love that seemed destined to last a lifetime, it's no wonder they were in such good spirits. But heavy rain the previous day had caused the river wharf to swell. As Barry and Lynn neared Barden Bridge, the water rose nearly five feet in less than a minute. It's possible that they noticed the rising water but didn't consider it a threat, and they decided to walk towards the shore to take a closer look. They may not have heard stories about Bolton Strid growing up, and if they hadn't, who would blame them for assuming that such a narrow stretch of river couldn't possibly pose a threat in such conditions? Shortly thereafter, a man named Desmond Thomas, who had always walked by the river, with his family, saw a man's lifeless body bobbing through the muddy and agitated water near Bolton Strid. At one point, the deceased man's pale and expressionless face popped up and looked right at him, not unlike the corpse from Gertrude Atherton's story. Later that day, another similar sighting was reported in the same area. Police were alerted quickly, but at the time, there had been no people reported missing and the conditions were too swift and dangerous for rescue and recovery divers to enter the water. However, alarm bells were raised when Lynn and Barry failed to return to their cottage. After repeated calls from friends and family members went unanswered, they feared the worst. Meanwhile, time ground to an excruciating halt as they waited for word, and for a few days they held out hope that Lynn and Barry would turn up no worse for wear. Then, on the sixth day, Lynn's distraught parents learned of the tragic loss of their child after a local water bailiff discovered her body near a ware in Addingtonham, West Yorkshire. After making the heartbreaking discovery, the bailiff stated that he witnessed flash floods in Bolton Strid before, and that the suddenness and ferociousness of the one that took Lynn and Barry had been particularly astonishing. Even for a preoccupied young couple who never experienced anything like it, it's difficult to imagine how the situation could have gotten out of hand so quickly. After all, Lynn and Barry were young, fit and smart, and according to those who knew them best, they were sensible. Nonetheless, both families hoped that Barry's body would turn up sooner rather than later, and the two could be taken to their final resting place together. However, Barry remained trapped in the river for nearly a month before finally emerging miles downstream. As with Arthur Smith, police quickly ruled out foul play and the coroner delivered open verdicts because no definitive cause of death could be established. Just a few months after they had been married, the couple was buried at the same church where they had been married. While investigating the case, one detective had a poignant and emotional experience while visiting Collett's cottage, which was strewn with wedding cards and presents and a few uneaten slices of cake that they had saved from the big day. We'll never know if they went in together or separately. Maybe they were still holding hands. If not, Lynn may have gone in first. And like the star-crossed young man centuries earlier, Barry may have drowned after jumping in to try to save her. But before they passed away, ironically, had Barry's original honeymoon booking not fallen through, they may have not wound up at that particular spot on that particular day, and they might still be alive with us today. That's all I have for you in today's video. I appreciate you watching until the end. And if you found this story both fascinating and heartbreaking, be sure to show some love to the like button and subscribe to the channel for more stories like this one. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one.